All right, are we good? Okay, good. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, this is my talk, Red Team Yourself. We're going to talk about uh, adding more capabilities to your existing security program. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Thomas Richards. I think this is my fifth time here presenting. So who's here first time at GERCON? That's a lot of you. Holy crap. <laughs> well, welcome. I'm glad you came into my talk, and I hope you guys have fun today. Uh, I just got promoted, uh, so I am no longer a senior consultant. I am now an associate principal consultant at what is now Synopsys. Uh, I previously worked for Sigil. We got acquired just about a year ago. I am our red team domain lead. I am responsible for our red team in practice. Uh, that comes from execution overview, sales call, SAO creation, template, uh, staff training, all sorts of stuff. Uh, there's my Twitter. I generally pick up about four new followers every talk. It's been the average, so hopefully that continues through today. And I've spoken before at a whole bunch of different conferences, besides San Francisco, Carolina Con, Derby Con, here, which is awesome, uh, and AppSec DC. So who here is responsible or participates in security testing for their organization? Okay, awesome, awesome. That's a good start. So for the folks that do the testing, who does any sort of uh, social engineering or physical pen testing or any sort of adversary emulating testing as part of that program? That's more than my last talk, so that's awesome. Uh, I have a slide in here that says, if no one raises their hand, cry. Um, so <laughs> I'm happy that at least a few of you are doing it. Uh, so that's really the purpose of this talk, right? So a lot of organizations will do their security testing in sort of a silo, right? You'll do just your network. You'll do just your web apps, right? But you're not going to incorporate any sort of adversary emulation into that testing. And what that means to find your, you know, do perform a whole holistic testing for the org. And it brings your security testing to the next level, right? So it's great to know that your network is reasonably secure, or at least you know where some of the bad things are, right? And it's good to know that your web apps will genuinely respond, but there's going to be areas where those domains overlap, especially when you incorporate the people that use these systems, that you really have to test it as a whole to see how resilient it is against an attacker. So what is red teaming? The classical definition of red teaming is challenging a group's preconceived notions, assumptions, and or processes, right? So it's looking at what some group of folks are doing and go, are you doing the right thing and why? These generally function as three of the following things. We have vulnerability probes, simulation exercises, and alternative analysis. So most of what we do in InfoSec ends up being around the vulnerability probes, right? You're looking for issues, but there's also simulation. So running uh, like war gaming, for example, and alternate analysis, we'll get into a bit in the next slide, you know, looking at a body of information and see if the first folks came up with the right conclusions if you do something that's Make sure there's no bias when you're reviewing a set of data. A little bit of a history. Uh, one of the oldest methods of red teaming actually came from the Catholic Church. So there was a position in the church, I forget the Latin name for it, um, that's called the devil's advocate. That role was meant to question um, people going up for sainthood. So for those of you who are not Catholic, when someone gets... In order to grant statehood, they have to perform some sort of miracle, right? So, of course, every village, city, town wanted to have their own saint. So they would say, oh, this individual performed this miracle. Please grant them statehood, right? So all of a sudden, you have a huge spike in saints. And finally, someone said, why don't we make sure these miracles are real? You know, uh, we want to grant real saints. So they had a position in the church whose role was to challenge the evidence that was presented to them before someone was granted sainthood. This position was active until the mid-90s, and actually Pope John Paul II removed that position, and then you saw also a huge spike of saints come uh, in the Catholic Church after that. The military uh, uses this a lot and has for a while. We do, you know, game theory was developed this way, war gaming against the Soviet Union. That's where 
this whole simulation and alternative analysis started coming in is when we were going up against the Soviets in the Cold War. Right? So it's looking at uh, what will the Soviets do in response to something that we do. Right? And how will we respond if the Soviets start doing some sort of maneuver. Right? So that's where that started to come out so that people we could be more prepared for when the Soviets were doing this or any adversary uh, potentially was doing this. The CIA also has what they call a red cell. So the CIA, you know, looks through intelligence and tries to figure out what someone's doing. So what the red cell's position is is to look at that body of evidence. Say, for example, again, to use the Soviets, you're on the Soviet desk, right? What you do is you pay attention to everything the Soviets do all day and go, hey, there could be missiles, they're moving missiles, they're doing something with missiles, right? Well, your job is to find the crazy stuff the Soviets are doing. So, of course, you're going to find crazy stuff the Soviets are doing, right? So what the CIA Red Cell would do is they would take the same body of information, have folks that are not part of the Soviet desks, so they wouldn't have a bias, and look at the information, see if the first analyst came to the right conclusion. And that's if the CIA right cell comes to a different conclusion, that's where you start to figure out, well, what's going on? So that played pretty predominantly and still does operate today uh, when it comes to the intelligence feed coming in from the CIA. And of course, uh, the government has uh, red teaming as well. Homeland Security actually does a lot of red teaming. Uh, not all of it has sort of repercussions. Uh, the FAA actually ran a lot of red teaming exercises against airports and airplanes in the 90s leading up to 9-11 and then more so after 9-11, right? Uh, and they discovered a number of vulnerabilities that were going on in the airport and the systems and would try to warn people about them, but there was no procedure to actually fix what they found. So they were going, hey, there's a lot of bad stuff here, like someone could do something really awful, which is what we found out someone did do, right? Uh, and their message wasn't heard. So obviously after 9-11, they got a little bit more uh, power and authority to institute changes when they find something that's wrong. But I mean, who reads the articles every year one comes out that they're still sneaking guns and bombs through the airport really easily? Like 90% of the time they try and hide a gun through the airport scanner, it works, right? So stuff like that is pretty scary. And then the NYPD also does a lot of tabletop exercises, specifically after 9-11. How will the city will respond? You know, like the mayor will sit in these exercises and they'll throw challenges out and change the situation to see how the different departments will uh, react. We're like a big board game going on at NYPD to see how they'll respond to attack. Well, we're going to talk about this in more of an info set context, right? So we're going to talk about vulnerability probes. And we're going to take it above what folks were already doing and say, these are going to be goal-oriented assessments, right? We're not just going to look at the, the broad scope of your network. We're going to have a goal, right? Can we get domain admin? Can we get to your financial database? Can we get to your customer database? Where the testers will attempt to emulate a perceived adversary and use any means necessary within scope to achieve that goal, right? We're not just hunting bugs. On a red team, I am not trying to find all the vulnerabilities on your network so that your teams can remediate it. I am trying to achieve that goal. And that's what your testers should be doing too. Always look for the goal. Now, obviously, bugs will be found, right? You will find vulnerabilities in the people, the process, and technology, and you'll have to remediate on those. But the goal is not to find the most bugs. We're also going to have risk assessments. I actually had a gig here. Um, we did discussions, you know, with relative stakeholders to understand a certain piece of technology or business process around that technology and how it's used. And you want to identify the risks in the people, technology, and processes uh, that could be exposed, right? So what this came through, we had a client um, come to us and they had a process. They were like a, a middleman for, uh, not investment bankers. What the hell is the word? It was, they moved a lot of money, basically. So it was uh, hedge funds, hedge funds. So they were the middleman for hedge funds, right? So the hedge funds would work with this bank to get the money from the client, move it into a holding account, and then move it into the hedge fund for investment, okay? So the fun part was is that the bank never actually met the client. They were working with the hedge fund, and they would email these documents. They were literally emailing scanned documents to move millions of dollars. Right? Nothing could go wrong there at all, right? That's totally fine process. We'll just email these documents in. 
Uh, they did have a lot of controls in place, which was fantastic. But what we ended up finding was a lot of their controls could be bypassed, especially from an internal attacker. Documents were easily forged to make it look like it came through, and we saw gaps in their uh, process that allow someone maliciously inside to move money on behalf of a client without them knowing because of the days that it took to notify people after something was moved, you can move money pretty quickly using an insider threat. The fun part was they had a, a maker checker paradigm, right? So someone would create the order to move the money and someone else had to approve it. Well, in the system, the person that created the order could choose who was going to approve it. So two people working together could obviously collude to move this money, right? So that was an interesting uh, gig that we had. Why red team, right? Security testing, what I'm finding with a lot of our clients, we end up doing just with your blinders on, right? We'll come in and just do network, right? We'll just work with the network security team. We'll just work with the software security team, the application security team. We'll just do mobile tests, right? We'll just test, you know, their physical building or what have you. But gaps exist in these technology bases where they overlap, right? There are trust relationships that are going on between these where if you don't look at the system as a whole and where those trust relationships live, vulnerabilities could come from those when trust is misplaced or misconfigured. And it's going to test the security posture of the entire organization or the business unit faced uh, with a real adversary, right? We try our best to emulate this adversary going through, and that's what you should be doing too when you're testing to see how these parts of the organization will withstand. Again, not just a bug hunt. Uh, and this is a, a good example of difference between red teaming and doing a traditional like network pen test, what have you. So we were doing uh, red teaming against the firm. They had a very limited external footprint, very limited external footprint, only a couple servers running. What we did find is they had an SFTP server, right? So good. If people want to send data in or they want to send data out to the clients, they have SFTP that's using credentials. Okay, they could use certs, but they were using credentials. What we did find is that that server accepted SSH connections, but it would terminate the connection after five seconds. So if you logged in with SFTP, your session stayed active, but if you tried to log in with a shell, it would drop you after five seconds. We were able to fish their employees and get working sets of employee credentials. Then we were able to log into the SSH session, and in that five seconds, it happened to be a Windows box. We dumped uh, the one-liner for Cobalt Strike to pull down Beacon, and we pulled down Beacon. The service was running as administrator, so we had complete control of the box. It was in the DMZ, but there was no filters from the DMZ into the internal network. We had domain administrator within 20 minutes, just because they had it misconfigured to allow SSH to even connect. Right? If that was a network pen test and how our methodology goes for a normal network pen test, you would scan it, you would see the SFTP, and you go, oh, okay, that you know that banner shows that the service is up to date, right? You're not missing any patches. There's no vulnerabilities with that service. Perfect. But on the red team, we took over their entire network through that service. I had another one where a client didn't know a box was still up. So we found a box that didn't have uh, two-factor authentication on it, logged in, and got access to the entire law firm's uh, history of records from like 2012 or 2010 or something. It's crazy. Uh, and we were on the readout call. They were like, wait, what box is that? I said, oh, this, this IP, you know, it was this service. And they were like, that, that was supposed to be decommissioned. They had a box spun up that was to test external access for their lawyers to get to their case files, right? And they didn't enable two-factor because it was just a test. And then they left it on. There actually was a decommission notice. They got the note from the team that the server was turned off. They showed us the email that the team emailed them to say that the server was turned off, but it wasn't. So those sorts of things is what you start to find on a red team. With adversaries, businesses should be concerned and are concerned with threat actors, right? You're looking at your internal and your external threat actors, and different threat actors will present themselves between different businesses, right? Certain organizations will be more concerned about, like, nation state. Uh, certain organizations will be more concerned about, you know, uh, criminal enterprises. Just look at what happened with WannaCry and the malware rise that we're seeing with these uh, locker bots that are just, you know, encrypting everything and forcing them to pay a ransom, right? Ransomware. So that's a threat, and we had a couple clients come to us and say, we want to test to see how we respond to some sort of ransomware attack. 
it was interesting to try and create a process around that, but they, we asked, we were asked for that, right? Uh, when you do a red team, you want to try to emulate these threats, right? So what would drive someone to do these sorts of attacks? What sort of, uh, resources would they have available to themselves to carry out these sort, these attacks against the organization? Their techniques, their tools, their skill set, and their targets. Who would you target to achieve this goal? Before you start red teaming, you really need to know yourself, right? So a business, you know, must be able to identify the following so that they can even begin to test it. You have to know where your assets are. Where are your informational assets? Where are your tech assets? And where are your physical assets? And also your business process. How do your CSRs respond to someone calling the help desk and saying, I need to reset my password? What sort of authentication is there? to prevent someone from resetting someone's password. Or your uh, HR department, whoever handles your benefits or retirement information, can you just call them up and get someone's account number by pretending to be that employee, right? What happens there? So you have to understand your business processes so you can begin to test them. The basic elements for a red team assessment end up being the electronic, the social, and the physical, right? So those are the domains that I was talking about before, where they all sit. And then right in the middle there, that's red teaming, right? We're doing everything. We're looking at where everything overlaps to see how the system will respond. When we talk about your electronic footprint, we're talking about computers, right? Computer software, uh, your web apps that you use or write, your thick clients, uh, your network, external and internal, your wireless networks, mobile technologies, embedded technologies. We actually took over a client's phone system once, and this was fun, because we got on, we started hopping on their conference calls. We could see when conference calls were going on, so we started hopping on the conference call, and one of the conference calls was about a new data center build-out they were having. So they were like, okay, great, you know, the consultants started listening. And they brought up about the security of the data center. And they started saying a couple things, and the consultant actually has a lot of data center background for the secure, securing data centers, and started piping up in the conversation and talking about, you know, standards, the ISO standards for database, uh, data center security, and what they should implement, and what, like, vendors or things they should look at when doing this stuff. And every one of the calls, like, yeah, yeah, no, that's good, that's good, yeah, that's good. They get off, you know, it was a conference call, some people in a room, some people remote. So they get out, and uh, our POC was in the call, and he knew the consultant's voice. So he, you know, kind of kept quiet through the whole thing. And at the end, they walk out, and they said, like, one of the, the higher managers was like, hey, wait, who was that on the phone? <laughs> like, giving all those good advice, we want to talk to them. Uh, so you never know what could be vulnerable. You know, you see all the time with uh, security systems, badging systems, default passwords. I was walking into our uh, office in New York, and we're in, we were at whatever floor we were in, and they had monitors put up so that you could see that you were on camera, right? So you walk into the, the lobby, go to the elevator bank, and there's the cameras there, right? Fine, good. Well, we were coming back from lunch, and I'm looking up, and I'm going, wait a minute, the guy is doing a software upgrade on the the monitor and didn't realize it was being mirrored out to the hallway and I was watching him type in the IP address and I watched him type in the username and type in the password. All just sitting in the lobby and I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, I'm right here. Come on. So, you know, these sort of systems that you rely on can have issues in them as well when they're not being thoroughly tested or vetted, etc. Your social aspect, uh, your people, right? Your phone numbers, social media accounts, corporate and personal. It's fun what people put on their personal uh, accounts when they don't lock the privacy settings down. Uh, find your email addresses and also look at your business processes, right? Your CSRs. What happens when someone calls you and you answer the phone? We had two things with this. Uh, we were doing a client on the West Coast. So I called in early morning their time. So it was, you know, 8 o'clock my time, 5, 5 a.m. their time. I'm calling into their numbers, looking for, listening for the uh, voicemail greetings to get their names, right? Because I didn't have their names. I had their DID ranges, but I didn't have who was at what extension. So I would just call in and hit the extension and get their name. So when I would call back in in their normal business hours, I'd be like, oh, hey, Frank, you know, this is Tom from IT. I need to, you know, help you out with your computer. So they established an instant rapport. 
The scary thing was when someone answered the phone at 5 o'clock in the morning, and I kind of just like screamed and hung up. I'm like, well, what are you doing working at 5 o'clock in the morning? Like, go to sleep. Um, the other thing was uh, one of the, the clients, one of the employees was really proud of her new office. So she moved offices for this client, and it was a law firm, and it took pictures of her desk. The problem was her computer was unlocked, and I could see client documents on her desk. Right? So that force them to institute a, a clean desk policy and also institute a social media policy because of an opposing uh, counsel found that, that they're posting pictures of case documents onto Facebook that could be very detrimental to any cases they had going on. Physical. Your buildings, that's one easy, right? Your facilities, where are your physical buildings? Where are your data centers? Access control technologies. How are people into your building? Are you still using the clonable RFID badges? A lot of people are. Uh, and your badge process. How do you get a badge? We had one, I was doing another red team for a client and it was a physical and one building was using the, the high secure, uh, they had two buildings across the street from each other, two different management companies. One was using the high secure uh, RFID badges. The other one was using the low-frequency badges, the ones you can easily clone with a Proxmark. And the employees would walk back and forth between the buildings with their badges around their neck, just clearly walking around with their badges. So we just pretend we were tourists, had a nice camera, were out, and were snapping pictures, got high-res pictures of their badges. I just went to Staples and printed them out on a piece of paper, put them in a badge holder, and walked into the building. Right? Because no one, you know, everyone held uh, doors open for people, you know, how you doing, pretend you're on your phone, you know, sort of like, so what, got to make sure you have, like, a badging process to vet that people that have a badge are supposed to have a badge. When you're building this internally, right, this isn't just a normal uh, a testing group. I mean, you can use folks that you're doing testing with already, uh, but you need to have these dynamics to have a successful red team or any successful internal security testing team, right? Uh, you need to have a good team dynamics. You have to have leaders and assessors. You need to have managerial support. And what I like to see in there is sort of a run book or a guide for the team to operate at, as well as governance documents. We had a couple clients come to us, ask us to build these internal red teams. And the governance documents, they're a pain to write, but they go a long way to echo what this team is going to be doing and make sense for the business. Because we have to talk business when we get to this, not just tech, got to talk business. Where is the red team going to sit, right? The effective red teams need to be placed somewhere on the org chart, right? Have to, you know, be responsible to someone. Someone has to have authority, but also be semi-independent. You want to try and remove bias during the testing because any bias or assumptions that the tester might make on how the organization or business unit or technology or system will respond to an attack could impact their testing and could give you not solid results, right? You want to be far enough away to remove the bias, but you also want to be close enough to be taken seriously. If no one listens to what the red team says, then you're not going to succeed. You could find the worst vulnerability in the world. You know, if someone finds this, our business is done sort of vulnerability. And if there's no uh, framework or policy in place or managerial support to support this getting fixed, then the red team is just about useless, right? It's not about... You know, as much as we like hacking stuff and doing all that cool hacking stuff, that's not the actual goal of these assessments, right? It's to improve the security posture of your internal stakeholders or your clients or whoever you are. You don't want them to find bad things, right? I've had gigs where I, I found nothing. I mean, there were different reasons why we found nothing serious, but we, we found nothing, right? And those are rare, but they do happen. Every once in a while, someone gets it right. You want to have the least possible levels of management uh, at above your stakeholder, right? You don't want a bunch of middle managers being able to stop you from doing testing. Be like, oh, we're not ready to do that yet. Oh, our team doesn't need this to happen. No, the person who has the authority to execute on the, you know, say we're testing, needs to have global authority in the org to say we're doing testing so that it will succeed. The leader, I like to see... 
how I position this with clients, you want to have the leader to be a senior member of the organization, obviously, and someone who has boots on the ground experience. You want someone who has done this before so they can lead the assessors. They need to be able to motivate the testers so they should know how a tester will function and what drives them to go, and also understanding the business risk, right? So the tester will get the tech stuff, and you get this report at the end, and you go, all right, well, what do we do now? What does this mean for the business? What does this mean for us? So you need to be able to communicate in risk what this means to the organization. And also be responsible for performing goals, setting the goals for the team, and also performing oversight. The assessors need to be able to think maliciously, right? This is thinking outside the box. It's being bad, but being allowed to be bad, right? Abusing systems and how they're not meant to be tamed, um, and looking at that hacker mindset, right? Uh, you want people with varied backgrounds. I am so surprised at the crazy hobbies I had as a teenager carry through into this career. It is nuts that I didn't think I would ever use those skills or tools, but it happens. So you want people with not even traditional IT backgrounds uh, to be part of your testing process because it's not about, I can teach hard skills. Right? I could take someone and show them the process of doing a web app pen test. Right? It's pretty prescriptive at this point, right? Configure tool, scan tool, look at tool output, and then do manual testing based on documents we've created. It's pretty prescriptive. But I can't teach someone how to interpret those, that tool output. You know, I'll be looking at, I just had it uh, last week, I was looking at a report that I was looking over, and the finding was, you know, verbose server header. Right, so the server was echoing back its version and, and make or what have you. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, Sun 1 server 6.1? That doesn't seem right. And there wasn't any other corresponding finding. I'm like, I'm pretty sure this is end of life. You know, Sun server, like, let's look into that. And it turned into another finding, right? So how do you interpret the results where the scanner flagged, oh, you know, it's, it's a server version. And this is the other fun thing is a lot of the network scanners, do a horrible job of checking versions of like weird software. So Tomcat's a perfect example. Nessus misses Tomcat versions like crazy. It'll flag as an informational, hey, I found the Tomcat version. But for some reason, it can't like figure out that it's seven years out of date. Uh, I found that with Nessus all the time. Uh, so it's stuff like that, looking at the results and interpreting it in, in a human way. I can't teach someone how to do that. That's the hacker mindset. Have to have people that are comfortable lying, cheating, and stealing to their coworkers and or friends, right? If you're working for the company doing this stuff, you're going to be going against people that you hang out with at lunch or at the company party or what have you. So you need to be able to do that in an effective way. And the goal that I put to all this stuff is to not get people fired, right? Because you fell for a phishing attack doesn't mean, you know, you fail as a person, doesn't mean that the security uh, testing uh, security awareness program was bad. I had a client actually run their own phishing campaign during the time of my phishing campaign. They beat me by a day. So already everyone was spooked about any emails coming in, right? Uh, we actually got people to fall for it too, which was good. So you never know how this stuff is going to, you know, be carried out. And you need to be able to, they're going to be the ones conducting the engagement. The managerial support. As I mentioned before, you're going to live or die by this. You need executive level support, like C-suite support, to carry out uh, this sort of testing and have the authority to issue and okay any test that you are doing. And the program also needs to be visible. You need a seat at the table to go, hey, we just did all this stuff. We found all this stuff wrong, and we have started fixing it, and now we're down to this pile of bad, right? That's important. Executives like metrics and graphs and numbers, excuse me, you know, how many vulnerabilities did we find? How bad were they that we found before? Have we improved over the next year? Metric collecting is pretty important in this as well, and that's what will allow the manager to show that the team is positively impacting the organization. You want to have goals, right? People are going to ask, why do we need this? What is it going to do? We need to protect X asset. We need to increase corporate security. There's going to be goals here and have right, mission statements as well so that when someone goes, what are you guys doing? It's written down, right? We're doing this. And it also helps the team to stay on track, 
right? You're going to have some sort of mission to carry out. You also need to be able to explain the risk the team discover, right? Why, why is this important? Is what it comes down to. The adversary at million attacks, looking at why, well, doesn't our normal testing do this? Well, no, because we're missing part of it and we're trying to get better, right? Oh, common pushbacks, right? My users will always fall for a phishing attack. <laughs> okay, uh, let's talk about that, right? Let's, <laughs> let's take a step back. Um, do you do awareness training? What is your awareness training? How will we improve your awareness training going forward, right? And then let's put it to test, right? Let's uh, test them to see how they fall, right? We average 10% is like industry standard to for fish for fishes to land, right? You expect 10% of the people you send emails to to fall for it. That's industry standard right now. Uh, if you fall, you know, 50 fall, okay, well, now, now there's a problem, right? Half your org shouldn't fall for this. Uh, and then if less than 10% fall, perfect. All right, how are we going to, how are we going to fix this going forward, right? I've also had clients, uh, say this, and I'm like, okay, well, then give us a set of credentials. Make a user, give us a set of valid credentials, and we will just start from the inside, right? Let's skip the outside part of it. We'll just start from the inside and go from there. And to see how your inside, uh, holds up to attack. How is this different from normal testing? We already covered this a bit in the slide deck. Um, adversary eliminate, you know, we're going to pretend to be real adversaries, go after the organization, uh, et cetera, et cetera. My system network application doesn't do anything sensitive. We wouldn't be a target. If you're on the internet, you are a target. No matter what, right? Especially with the ransomware, like I mentioned before, it's not even about, you know, poning the box and using it to conduct other attacks. They're ransoming you with your systems. You know, they're crypto locking it and asking you to pay Bitcoin. Like this, the fact that this is even possible is crazy. Uh, but you are a target. Everyone's a target. If you're on the internet, you're a target. If you're here, you're a target, right? Uh, Wi-Fi, right? Fun stuff. Um, you have to protect your corporate access. You have to protect your network. You have to protect your IP. What drives the business needs to be protected. It has to. You're going to piss people off. Uh, red teams will piss people off uh, every time. You'll have some manager um, that doesn't like what happened or wasn't fully aware of it. We did a red team for an org. We had to test their data center. Right, and there was a, a physical separated area inside the data center for high security information. Right, so if there was a whatever service they sold, they had you know a separate, more secure data center. So they wanted to make sure other people in the IT group couldn't get into that data center. Within three or four hours, we did everything we could think of to own that system through, under, and over. Fun part, the screws for the cage in the separate secure data center were on the outside. So you could just unscrew the cage and just take the cage apart. They stopped us when we got to that step. <laughs> we're not like, going to just go in and unscrew the cage. All right, you know, go. Um, that organization had a turnover in security management because they started blaming us for breaking things, right? We had executive level support to do what we had to do, obviously. Uh, but the person who was in charge of physical security got really pissed, started blaming us for all this stuff. And it was awful. Uh, you know, you broke this, you broke that, you broke this. And it was like, well, we did take that apart, but you kicked this out before we could put it back. So just put that back. And that's how like, we have pictures to prove what we did. Uh, that manager isn't there anymore, we found out. We got a new manager who wants us to do more pen testing. So like, well, if you got into our super secure data center, we need to test everything else now. <laughs> um, the stakeholders in engagement have to have enough influence to withstand any political uh, heat, right? That manager, like I said, went to the top and started barking that we did something we weren't supposed to. You know, he wasn't alerted about it. His team wasn't aware. They broke stuff, you know, all this crazy stuff. But we had the level of support, and we did our due diligence that we could say, no, we, we did everything we were supposed to do, and here's what we did. And that's what unfortunately led to that person um, no longer working there anymore. But that's part, some unfortunately, sometimes part of the game. Uh, we don't want to see people fired. You know, what we do is to improve the posture, but when you negatively react to something like that, you know, of course, he spent his whole career telling people how secure this is, designing the secure network and the secure system, but then the bolts for the cage were on the outside. You know, it totally missed the ball. 
You want to have a red team run book, right? The team will rotate. You will have attrition. Normally happens in these teams. You don't always want to have the same testers on the team forever. You want to flip it out, switch it out, so that you get a uh, different insight to the testing, so that uh, you can get a more perspective or different background, right? So you want to have uh, a guide, right? How do we, as an organization, conduct red teaming? What does that mean? What steps do we follow? What tools do we use? We don't want it to be, I said steps, we don't want it to be a step-by-step -step guide, right? It's not go Y, do X, do this, do that. No, that's not red teaming. It's like uh, outline. You know, we go through this process. We do this stuff using these tools. It also uh, should cover all the phases of the assessment and how-tos and like common pitfalls that we found, like, hey, we tried to use this tool and we found that it's really useful to do it this way uh, to get these results, right? Don't forget this one crazy option that we forgot about and it made the tool start working. Uh, who's had that experience, right? You just, like, try to figure out a tool so hard and it's like that one effing switch, you're like, oh, now it's working, right? Happens. Uh, it's a living document, right? You're going to want the, the testers and the team to always be updating this document uh, as they go through. So talking about the phases, the way this is pretty well broken down, you know, recon is always the first phase, uh, and recon never stops, right? You're always going to be doing information gathering all the time during an assessment. Uh, it's incredibly important to fingerprint and understand everything on the system that you're testing, and it never truly ends and goes between passive and active, right? We have had times during assessments where we have switched midway because of something we found later on that we missed in our initial recon, that we said, oh, okay, we have to now go after that. Right. Passive recon is just defined of not actually touching the target at all. So you're looking at DNS entries, you know, who is information, doing some Google hacking, what can you find on the internet, uh, email address harvesting, looking at the facility on Google Maps. Google Maps' street view is awesome. You can like almost pan an entire building now to figure out where the ingress and egress points are, how big it is, and what's around it before we even go on site. Active recon is where we're going to start to actually touch the network, right? So we're looking at uh, everything that's going on, um, port scanning, uh, identifying, calling the numbers, right? Calling the help desk and see what we're needed to uh, validate that we are an employee. Is it social? Is it an employee number? Uh, fun fact, you can get almost anyone's last four of their social by those free person, uh, like the cost a dollar to do background checks. It actually comes back with the person's last four of their social. Uh, pretty scary. Um, vulnerability scans and doing, you know, on-site physical observations. Going into the building, trying to get in, seeing what that looks like. After you gather your information, you're going to want to plan your attack, right? What are you going to do? We found this vulnerable thing, let's pop this. Or we found this website, we're going to clone. Let's clone this website and launch this phishing campaign. Uh, that's where we start to get everything ready, have your landing sites, your domains, you know, your payloads all set to then go into the exploitation phase. And this is where we're going to start, you know, attacking the organization during exploitation. Actively exploit. We're going to follow those attack paths and change when necessary. Uh, perform the phishing attacks, perform the physical attacks, you know, do what we have to do to get on the inside to get that initial foothold within the organization. And then we have the fun post-exploitation, right? Pro progress towards the goal. Where is it? Is it just take domain administrator? That happens quite a bit. You know, they say, oh, see what you can do once you're inside. Mm, okay. So we'll just go after domain admin. You know, what, what can we find to do, right? Take over their phone system and start interjecting into their phone calls. Uh, target data exfiltration. We've had a couple clients set up uh, dummy data that is supposed to be triggered by their DLP. They'll tell us where it is, right, and why waste our time. Here's the IP address. Get in, go to this IP address, and try and get the data, uh, and try to get it out without being caught. Um, it's a, one of the best ways to test your DLP, right? Move stuff that should trigger the alert. Should, because it doesn't always do it. Your team needs to have a big bag of tricks, right? You need to have a wide variety of tools and documented when you carry out these attacks. So it's not just, uh, you know, common tools, but also specialized tools that you might just develop. Uh, we have a couple, you know, scripts and templates that we use quite a bit. Uh, physical testing tools, some open source tools. I stick more to open source. The only reason why we have, we pay for COBOL is because we have to pay for COBOL for, to abide by Rafi's license. We can't use COBOL Strike commercially 
without buying his license, right? So that's the only reason why we buy Cobalt. Uh, everything else is open source tools because not everyone has, you know, can buy those really expensive exploit packs. So we want to emulate a very common but sophisticated adversary. So when you're putting this all together, right, red teaming will add another layer to your security program. It'll make it more valuable and more impactful and reveal more issues to your organization than what you're doing already. Managerial support is critical to being able to execute on these tests. And you also want to make sure you create a proper team dynamic to execute on these tests. And then, of course, we want the process tools and documentation uh, to be up to date and to keep for the red team uh, so that they can still operate in the face of staff changes. Right? Thank you. All right, we got uh, quite a few minutes for, well, not quite a few, uh, but a few minutes for questions. Anyway, yes? What do you, what do you do? So the question is what happens if you get caught, right? Uh, you try and talk your way out of it as much as possible, right? Because by that point, you have probably something on you. And we, we had this happen. We did um, a late night pen test. Well, we got into the building and hid the wiring closet was centrally located. It wasn't in a secured area. So the consultants hid in the wiring closet for like 10 hours. OK? Um, they made you know fake telecom badges. And they happened to have spools of wire. So they looked like they were doing work. So they just sat in the, in the wiring closet for all day. And when they went to go break into the, the office part, uh, it was, you know, raised panel ceiling. So they popped the panel, jumped down over the wall, and there was someone there. <laughs> this is like 11 o'clock at night. I, I, it scared the consultant more than it scared the person sitting at their desk that just fell through the ceiling. Uh, and they were like, Oh no, we're here doing, you know, late night network work. We had to do it, you know, at night so we wouldn't disturb anyone. And the, and the employee was like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Let me, let me pack up now and get out of here. <laughs> it just left. <laughs> so you, you try not to get caught, right? But when we're doing physical pen testing specifically, we'll have like get out of jail cards. So it's a letter issued with content information on the people's letterhead, the corporate letterhead, uh, that says we're allowed to be there. Cause we have been stopped by law enforcement before. Right, this especially when you try to break into a bank, uh, it tends to, tends to trigger an alarm, um, and you want to be able to prove that you're not robbing the bank, that you have authorization to do this. So we carry that letter that has you know a number of contacts on it. We also carry a copy of our SAO, the contract that says you know the legally binding stuff that says we're able to do the work, right? So that you know you don't run from the cops. Number one. <laughs> Uh, and number two, you just say, you know, hey, I'm on the job. Here's the supporting paperwork. Here's the contact information. This is what we're going to do. Uh, you know, I'm here. I'm authorized to do this. And then the cops will validate it and then they'll let you go. Um, I haven't had anyone brought to a station yet. It's always been handled on site. So you find you find ways around it. Anyone else? Okay. Well, uh, again, thank you very much. I'll be here all weekend, and then uh, look forward to seeing you guys. Thank you for coming.